tonight we're going to talk about something called the Grand Army of the Republic and the local camp for the Grand, the Grand Army of the Republic and some other organizations. The Grand Army of the Republic was uh, started in 1866 in Decatur, Illinois by a doctor named Benjamin Stevenson. And uh, it was for uh, Union Army, uh, U.S. Navy, Marines, and something called the Revenue Cutter Service, which I guess is kind of like the Coast Guard. And it was a it was a fraternal organization. All these soldiers had come home from the Civil War, and lots of them had stories, uh, lots of them had friends and experiences, and they wanted to share those. When the GAR, as it was affectionately called, uh, it was arranged uh, or organized in state. Very every state had had one of them. Uh, and then they would have a post in the town uh, that would make up, be made up of Civil War veterans, Union Civil War veterans. There is also a, an equivalent Sons of the Confederacy. And we're going to be talking about the Union side of it tonight. But we did have posts in every state of the nation and some uh, in overseas locations. And by the, the height of the GAR, there were over 7,000 posts. So, you know, there were lots, lots of different soldiers that, that fought in the Navy people that fought during the Civil War. This organization became probably one of the first political action groups going along. They uh, had several platforms that they liked to, uh, to espouse to which included voting rights for black veterans. Uh, you know, this is just right after the Civil War and uh, uh, the, the blacks had been freed during that time period. Veteran pensions were a big deal. And those were, those were argued about for years. And even, uh, we have a census of 1890 here where they talk about veterans and veterans' widows and who was getting pensions. Even after that, into the 19, up to 1910, 1915, they were having discussions in our newspaper here about pensions for Confederate veterans. The thing was that uh, this organization had a lot of power, and they put the, they supported Republican candidates for president, and essentially they elected five different presidents with mm -hmm. their power. Ulysses S. Grant, who was a, a Army general during the Civil War. Ruth for B. Hayes, James A. Garfield, Benjamin Harris, and McKinley. So they, they did have a lot of power, really pushed for the, the Republican Party and the ideas of the Republican Party. The other thing that was important was that the G, out of the GAR became something that was called Decoration Day. And this was actually started by General John A. Logan, who was a national commander of the GAR. And as a national com commander, he issued what was called Order Number 11. It established Decoration Day on May 30th, and it was it was a big deal for many many years. The first mention of, of it being called Memorial Day was about 1882. It was declared in the, the official name in 1967. So it hasn't been that long ago. I guess 67 is very 43 years, 46 years, but. They named it the final uh, Monday of May in 1971 is when we celebrate uh, Memorial Day. Uh, we in the GAR still like to, to recognize the Civil War veterans on May 30th and be uh, in the spirit of what uh, uh, General Logan uh, wanted it to be. Uh, Gary Shell uh, does a nice lecture on John A. Logan. If you ever go to, to uh, Carbondale, you'll see John A. Logan uh, University over there. He was very instrumental. He even ran, I think, for vice president at one time after, after the war. There are three separate parts of, for the GAR, fraternity, charity, and loyalty. And the fraternity was is that they would have regularly scheduled meetings, uh, usually once or twice a month. They would have things called campfires where they would sit around the fire and kind of talk about the old days. Uh, what it was like, some of the battles that they each had been to. They probably complained about the food, they probably complained about the officers, uh, the typical soldier stuff. And then they would have encampments. We would, they would have local encampments, state encampments, and national encampments. The charity part was that they, they were looking 
to, to get federal funds for the relief of veterans, their and widows, the, the soldiers who's, uh, who had died, and orphans, people that were left without, without means of support. And loyalty, and that was really loyalty to the cause of the Union. They wanted to establish monuments, and they did that all over the United States. Preservation of Civil War sites, and donation of battlefield mementos and documents to museums. They had, a, they had a uniform. It wasn't the military uniform that they wore while they were in the service. They typically wore a double-breasted dark blue coat, bronze buttons. And with that hat that you see on the gentleman on the left is called a slouch hat. It was made out of felt and it would have a gold wreath and, and insignia and a card around it. And then a bronze star badge, similar to what we all wear here, but it was a specific shape that would be hung from a small chiffon flag. The star and relief depicted a soldier and a sailor clasping hands in front of a figure of liberty. Members wore these insignias in their late uh, lapels so they could be easily identified. This led to them being sarcastically termed bronze button heroes, and they also referred to each other as comrades, and we still do that in our modern day Sons of Union veterans. I have a picture of my wife's great great grandfather who was uh, in the Collinsville, Illinois GAR. Uh, he was the last surviving member having been run over by a streetcar in 1920. He, he actually is sitting with his hat on his lap and you can see his medal and his, uh, his uh, coat. Now, we had only one woman was ever a member of the GAR. And we'll talk about women's organizations after this, but Sarah Edmonds, who uh, fought with the 2nd Michigan Infantry, actually she was a spy first. She got in dressed as a boy. She went on several spy missions. One time she had her face blackened so that she could appear to be an African American and got data from uh, the Confederacy and came back and, and to help uh, the Union side. She was also a nurse, and when she died, or before she died, she wrote a memoir, Nurse and Spy in the Union Army. And one of her quotes was, I'm naturally fond of adventure, a little ambitious, and a good deal romantic, but patriotism was the true secret of my success. She was not the only woman to serve in the uh, Civil War. I think there were over 100 women that masqueraded as men and, and, and fought. She actually went by an alias called Frank Thompson, and with her, due to her work as a spy and as a nurse, she was allowed to go into the GAR. I, I mentioned encampments. The first national encamp encampment in 1966 was in Indianapolis, Indiana. And the last encampment in 1949 was also in Indianapolis, uh, Indiana. They had encampments in 22 states. Easternmost and northernmost was Portland, Maine, and the westernmost was uh, Portland, Oregon, and the southernmost was Chattanooga, Tennessee. I bet that was kind of a brave one for them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As to go into Chattanooga. Yeah. I think they still remember, what was it, Vicksburg didn't even start doing the celebrate the 4th of July until sometime in, in the 1950s or something. <laughs> yeah. We did have a national encampment in St. Louis. It was on September 28th to 30th, 1887. This was one of the posters that came out of that encampment and a badge. And that medal that's on the far left was sold to raise money for a Grant monument. You know, Ulysses S. Grant was named a general over in Arcadia, Missouri. He lived, he and his wife lived up in St. Louis, and you can still visit their home at Whitehaven. <laughs> So that, that was a way to, to raise money. The other Missouri encampment that occurred in Kansas City in 1916. And these were big deals. They would set up tent camps for all these old soldiers to sleep in. They would get special rates. Uh, you can find online copies of tickets, special tickets that they would sell to the, to the veterans to uh, go to these encampments. I mentioned the one in St. Louis in September 1887. You'll note, see later that that was the year that our local GAR post was established. And in 1887, we had a few of our members go up to St. Louis. And I found this newspaper article. It said the old Rebs must have had a pretty hard road to hoe in St. Louis during the encampment week. 
we gave, given an instance of what happened, but an Irishman in a downtown saloon who boasted at the boys in blue, and sure, these are the fellows we chased over the fences at Vicksburg, whereupon one of the St. James boys is said to have called him a damn liar, <laughs> and laid him flat in the most approved <laughs> Don't really mess with the St. Genevieve boys. <laughs> I mentioned that it was farmed, the GAR was farmed in 1866. They didn't start keeping records of, of membership until 1878 at that encampment. There were 31,000. You can see that it, it grew until 1890 which is, what, 25 years after the end of the Civil War, they were up to almost 410,000 people. That's why they were such a big political force at the time. And then as the people started aging, you can see it started going down, going down, and going down, until 1956, there was only one member left. And his name was Albert Willis Wilson. And he was born in 1847, he was a drummer boy, and actually, Young children or boys, 13, 14, who served in the in the services. We have buried here in our cemetery a young man named Jacob Zimmer, who was like 14 or 15, and he was going to be sent to Vicksburg, but he fell sick here and actually died during St. Jimmy. Uh, one of our young men actually played him when we do a spirit reunion in the cemetery. So, but he was with the uh, Second Minnesota Heavy Artillery as a, as a drummer boy, and they actually built a, a memorial to him at Gettysburg. And if you've ever been to Gettysburg, they got lots of memorials, mm -hmm. but uh, that's one to, to Albert. I wanted to, to read something that White D. Eisenhower said. He said, the American people have lost the last personal link with the Union Army. His passing brings soul to the hearts of all of us who cherish the memory of the brave men on both sides of the war between the states. We call them allied, or allied orders, and this was kind of the women's side of the, of, to the GAR. The Women's Relief Corps started first, and I think they even had a, a called the Ladies, the Loyal Ladies League first, and then in 1883, they became the Women's Relief Corps. Well, actually, they changed that name in 1886 anyone could join the Women's Relief Corps. But then there's the ladies of the Grand Army of the Republic, also founded in 1883, and you must be a direct descendant of an honorably discharged Union veteran to be as part of the uh, ladies of the Grand Army of the Republic. A lot of times you'll see some of these old postcards and, and pictures and stuff. I pulled those off the internet, but they had some really flowery cards back then. We, uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of GAR history. There's actually a route, a, a highway called uh, US Route 6, which is called the GAR Highway. And at one time, it was the longest highway in the United States. I think it went from, uh, it was originally called the Roosevelt Highway. And then in 1953, it was declared the GAR Highway. And it went from Pro Provincetown, Massachusetts, way out on Cape Cod. And it went to Bishop, California, and then extended to Long Beach. But they had took out the Long Beach part or decommissioned it in 1965. So it's no longer the longest. It's, I think, the second longest highway in the United States. And you can kind of see with the red line where it goes. It doesn't go through Missouri. It goes through Iowa. And at that last national encampment, the post office issued a three-cent stamp. And you can still buy those on eBay and other places. But it was to commemorate the GAR, and you can see it up in the upper corner, and just, you can see the slouch hat um, there. And the GAR is mentioned in the song, You're a Grand Old Flag. We, we sing that song, but we only sing the first verse. It's kind of like Silent Night. Nobody ever sings the second verse of Silent Night. Well, if you look down to here, I like that verse two. It says, I'm no cranky, hanky, panky. I'm a dead square, honest Yankee. And then you get down to the last uh, little sentence that says, hurrah, hurrah, for every Yankee, Yankee tar, and old G-A-R, every stripe, every star. Red, white, and blue, hats off to you. Honest, you're a grand old flag. Mm -hmm. So it's one place where it's been, uh, the G-A-R has been memorialized. We've had several commanders in chief of the G-A-R from Missouri. They include William Warner in 1888, 1889, right after that St. Louis encampment. 1900, Leo Rossier, 
And then in 1907, 1908, a gentleman named George, uh, Charles German Burton uh, was the national commander. I mentioned that they had these national groups, then they have the state groups. Uh, the Department of Missouri was first organized in 1867, again, just right after the Civil War. And then it kind of fell out and then was reorganized in 18, 1882. Over the life of the, the Missouri GAR, there were over 500, and, well, there was 594 camps identified. Some that were near here, DeSoto, Lutesville, Fredericktown, Bollinger Mills, Farmington, uh, Perryville, the Defani Camp, and Gary just gave a talk on the Defani Camp recently. Belgrade, Cedar Hill, Ironton, Mineral Point, Yonk. Everybody know where Yonk is? Mm -hmm. uh, Patton, uh, Clearwater, Cape Girado, and Go Run, and Pilot Bob. I think Fredericktown got kicked out once. Some of them disappeared over time, but a lot of them were named after Civil War veterans. But then when you get to Iron County, or Ironton, it was just called Iron. But it's kind of interesting that when you go back and, and research some of these people, who they were, and we'll talk more about the St. Genevieve camp and why it's called that. But we didn't start off here in the early years of the GAR with a, with a camp. It wasn't until 1887, and it was in May, there was this, I found this in the newspaper, that uh, the GAR, they were going to organize it, a, a gentleman named Judge uh, William H. Vance, uh, started it and uh, said it was going to come up in the next week they were going to do this uh, initiation or uh, initiate this camp and the ex-governor Fletcher was supposed to come. Well I looked for the next week in the newspaper and Governor Fletcher didn't show up. <laughs> so they a little bit later they did get, I guess I'm trying to remember who it was that came in but there were, a, a gentleman came in didn't this May 7th when they identified all these people that were going to be in the camp. So that's really kind of the first notice we have of who was going to, who was going to be a member of the GAR. And then on May 26th, it finally got initiated. Colonel T.G. Rogers came in. He was an assistant adjutant general of the Missouri Department. And the initiation ceremony took place at Union Hall, which is, if you know St. Genevieve, just right up here where the Rosier store was where the church is redoing that, that building now, that was Union Hall. And it actually burnt and was replaced by Jokerston Yealy built a, a store there. And that burnt in 1922, and the present structure uh, was built. That This article said that 17 members uh, were going to join. And here are the founding members. They did provide a nice list. Uh, of the founding members of our camp. You know, we had that list from the previous newspaper article, and there were a couple of guys that didn't show up on this list. I think one of them was Eli Carter, and the other one uh, was uh, J.D. Thompson or something like that. But, uh, but, you know, you can see a lot of uh, German names in here, uh, like Schmarley and Vance and Jokerst and uh, Bernard Herzog. Beckerman, Schaefer, but then you also start seeing the French names that are in here too, the, the uh, Lallemandiers, the Lamures, Beauchamp, uh, Le Fleur, and you see a few American names like William Schools. The first officers that were elected, uh, and they had, uh, and, and we still in our Sons of Union veterans have similar kinds of positions, and a lot of the similar. The post commander was William Vance. Uh, Leon Joker, Senior Vice Commander, George Will Vice, Officer of the Day, William Skews, and uh, sure. Frank Bernard was Chaplain, Jacob Ely, Quartermaster, Surgeon Major of <laughs> Valentine Rottler, uh, who was also yeah. a brewmaster, so they had to have a good guy in there to make beer. <laughs> and the Sergeant at Arms was George Beggerman. It's okay if we Now, I said that they were farmed in May. Uh, All right. 1887, well, Decoration Day comes around right after that. And only three people show up for the first Decoration Day, and that was Judge Vance, Fanny Beyond, and Augustus Caesar Herdick. So it really wasn't a very big deal in 1887. 
Then in October they had their first campfire, and they first had they had their first campfire, I believe, at Maxwell Hill. Anybody know where Maxwell Hill is? Well, that was named after Father Jock Maxwell, and uh, by that at that time it was there were no houses up there or anything, so they went up to the highest point and uh, had their campfire and told stories and things of that sort. They were supposed to. I think it says they were going to have those just like every uh, Sunday afternoon. There wasn't much other references in the newspaper. Well, they're formed in 1887. They get their first unit inspection right after that in January of 1888. And it was a Perry County judge that came up and he inspected them. He, he, uh, there were 34 men, which is pretty good since they were only farmed you know, for about four or five months, six months. Uh, it says, uh, he was impressed by their appearance and condition. It, they weren't fully armed, though. They only had six muskets. Wow. <laughs> and the number and the same number of swords, but expects to purchase a full supply of arms this summer. A fifty-dollar flag had just been purchased. Uh, we, we'll hear about that flag a little bit later. And then in 1888, they had their first big meeting, and it was actually called a ball. And it was held at Union Hall, and it, it was a big deal. With lots of speeches, singing, they would have the, the Carnet Brass Band come in to, to uh, play music, very, very patriotic. And at that ball, they were presented with the flag, and it was the name of the post in gold letters. And then they also presented a portrait of a guy named J. Felix St. James. And that's who their post was named after. And Lieutenant Colonel J. Felix St. James was one of the first to volunteer in St. Genevieve for the Civil War, and, and some think in all of southeast Missouri. He eventually rose. He was a lawyer, but he did go in and serve. And he eventually got shot on April the 6th, let's see, 1862, at, at the Battle of Shiloh, and died. 52 years ago today. So, and he was well respected and well loved. And his brother, Augustus St. Jem, who spelled his name differently, it, it comes out of the St. Jem Bovey family. For some reason, J. Felix wanted to kind of Americanize it, so he said St. James. But uh, his brother kept this J. G. E. M. M. E. and eventually became the Provost Marshal here and was not as well loved as Provost Marshal. <laughs> as his brother Jay Felix was. But his brother Augustus St. Jim did put, give a picture or a portrait of J. Felix St. James, and we don't know what happened to it. We would love to, to find that. And the flag is, has disappeared. Sometimes we hear that they also got a sword. And I found that that was actually given to them the next year in 1889 and it was the sword of Captain William James, who, uh, who fought in the War of 1812. I was just looking at William James today. He owned a slave that I was trying to look up some history on. So, but that's where the sword comes from. It wasn't a Civil War sword. And then Decoration Day, 1888, the second year, this was a big deal. And you can see that there was a, a, a long write-up in the Herald. They, they eventually got Decoration Day to be a real deal. There would be parades, there would be talks and speeches, there would be bands in it, the children would come and go to it. I'm afraid when I look at what we do on, on Decoration Day now, and Fourth of July, it's, we've lost a lot of our patriotism over the years and the, and the displays for that. But, uh, this was a this was a big big event for the uh, GAR on their first decoration day, and here's a picture of it. Hmm. This is y'all know where the uh, Southern Hotel is, and it's got that little cupola up on the top. We believe the picture was taken from there. You can see all kinds of uh, GAR guys all in this room right here, and we know from that previous article. J. Felix St. James' wife was being honored that day, and we believe she's back here in this carriage. And you can see the old jailhouse, uh, which is now the prosecuting attorney's office and the, and the courthouse. This is the old brick. 
the building that was on the corner, uh, which was torn down about 1900, and that's when Open Peace Hardware went in there. We know this is before 1890. If you look, there's a, a there's the flag above the people. Above the people, I think that's a 38 star flag, and we didn't go to a 23 star flag until 1890. So that really kind of kind of dates that this picture. One of the questions we ask is, where were their headquarters? We see lots of notices to, we're going to have a meeting on Saturday afternoon at headquarters, be there, or Sunday afternoon. In 1895, we see this little announcement that they're going to install their officers at headquarters on Market Street. So that's a clue to us. And then in 1903, we're having a city election like we had today, and the third ward was at the Grand Army Hall above Herzog and Whitler's shoe store. So another clue. Well, you don't see advertising. All the advertisements for Herzog and Whitler's just says Herzog and Whitler's. Everybody knew where it was at. It didn't have a street address on there. It didn't say Martin Street. So that's been kind of confusing. We don't know exactly where that was. And, but in 1904, they proposed, they were, there was a notice that they were going to change their headquarters and they were going to vote on it. And so it said uh, every member should be present. Uh, it was going to be uh, the third Sunday in December. But then on the 24th, we see another announcement. It's going to stay at the uh, present site, the old headquarters over Herzog Shoe Store, arrangements being made to affect with Mrs. Bowman, the proprietor. Any of you familiar with the sandbar maps? They're one of our little treasures. Uh, sandbar was an insurance company. They came to St. Genevieve four different times, 1894, 1901, 1911, and 1929. And they would draw, actually in 19, well, this happens to be from 1901, and they would draw the outlines of buildings and tell if they're brick, if they're one story or two story or whatever. This happens to be the downtown area. This is Market Street running this way. Here's the church. And when I blew it up, I'm going to go into the upper left-hand corner. You see on that corner, there's one in yellow. That was a saloon. And you know that's where the, well, the first anvil was in town, the anvil restaurant. Then you see a brick structure, that's the red dwelling. And here you see a B&S cob cobbler. A B&S means boots and shoes. And cobbler, it was a, a, a guy that made shoes. So I'm going to play a little archaeologist in kind of, in, uh, this might be the location of the GAR, GAR headquarters. It would have been upstairs. This had the quarry workers on the first brick building, and then right next to it is the uh, Goodwill store. I still haven't made, I'm not sure exactly if they didn't tear that building down and rebuild this one. But I'm, I'm pretty sure that this was the location because the Bowmans owned that building, or that location back in, in 1901. Then, we see later on, in uh, 1907, they're talking about Decoration Day, and let's see, oh, they will leave um, headquarters at the residence of Frank Cook and visit the, the cemeteries. Uh, later on, in 1915, uh, they'll start at the GAR headquarters on Leahy Street, east on Leahy to Maine and kind of went to the cemetery and stuff like that. Well, we have a picture of Frank Hook's house from 1908. And it's on Leahy Street. It's actually at 230 Leahy, and uh, that house is still here. So as the, the population in the GAR was winding down, they moved from a, a hall to a, a private residence to be the, their uh, headquarters. Now they did, I mentioned that they did a, a ball. They had several of them. They had balls in 1888, 1889, 1893, and 1894. Not all of them were a financial success. So I guess they stopped doing them. The other thing they had were picnics. 
They were big in the 4th of July, but they had picnics in 1890, 91, 92, 93, 95, 97. In 1998, they went to Combs Cave for a picnic. And Combs Cave is just out in the industrial park area. 1898, 99, 1900, and 1902. The other thing they did is they celebrated a lot of other things, like Washington's birthday. When was the last time you saw a parade on Washington's birthday? They had them, and they were big time parades. Lincoln's birthday. They marched in the Knights of Pythias parade. I guess they liked to dress up in their uniforms and parade. They visited a Cape Civil War encampment. In 1893, they went to Farmington for a GAR reunion. Uh, several times I found that they had meetings in St. Mary's so that the St. Mary people that were in the GAR uh, camp could come up here, or didn't have to come up here, and that was in 1895 and 1898. And in 1899, they rented a train and went to St. Louis. So they, they tended to have a lot of that uh, fraternity, I think is what they called it. The other thing is, uh, well, here's the Washington birthday. They would have addresses. Uh, I, it just seems to me that we've lost something over the years of our, our remembering uh, our, our history. One of the other things they did is they would issue, if one, one of their members died, they would issue a resolution of respect. And uh, this is a great, uh, one of the ways I try to find out who was in our camp was to look at who the committee members were on the bottom here, and that one over there has a lot of them. And so, because we don't have records of, from the camp itself, we've got to figure out other ways to find out who was in the GAR. And we still have done letters of respect today if uh, one of our members or a member's family has died. I showed you that big picture from 1888. The only other pictures we have come from uh, World War I, 1918, when our young men were being drafted and sent off to war, they would pose and have a picture. And you can see in these pictures some old uh, Civil War bearded guys, and there's a guy with a sword in the middle, and it's the same way on that one there. They would send the boys off to the new war. Now, we probably had the Spanish-American War, or maybe the uh, in-between there. But we have very few pictures of actual events uh, that the GAR local camp did. Uh, one of the other things that we're trying to figure out is who were the post commanders over the years. We found William Vance, he served four years, Leon Jokers, uh, George Beckerman, five years, Roman Hook, three, Harry Roseman, only one, Anton Eckert, two, Leo Herzog, three, and the last ones was Charles Schuler, 1923-1924. But Frank Hook, whose house that I showed you on the previous slide, maybe two, four, six, eight, maybe eight or, or ten years, that he was the, the camp commander. Still had not found six years who was the commander. It's very, you'd find a newspaper article that says they elected the officers but didn't list the <laughs> officers. Uh, so we still got some work to do to find out the, the rest of our uh, post commanders. And based on looking at uh, newspaper articles, obituaries where they say this guy was a member of the GAR, those resolutions of respect, uh, just a variety of documents, we've identified 76 members of the GAR. Uh, they had uh, one newspaper article said they had 105 at the, over the, the whole lifetime. Uh, in, 19, in 1899, I think they only got 46. So people would die off and other people might, might join. But uh, it's like a who's who of the Civil War uh, on the Union side here in St. Genevieve. Uh, the last time the GAR participated in the Memorial Day was 1930. Uh, let's see what they had. Uh, what was Columbus? Oh. GAR veterans in autos. In 1924, there were only six GAR members left. By 1930, it was real, really starting to dwindle down, and, and these guys were getting pretty old. And the last GAR member here in St. Genevieve was a guy named Leo Herzog. 
uh, and the, the headlines for his obituary said, last Civil War veteran dies here on Wednesday. Well, that's not quite true. There was, I think, at least one other, John Reeder, who died after him, buried in Little Pine Cemetery. But he is the last GAR member standing, and his tombstone is out at uh, Dallas Springs. So that's it, it on the GAR and the GAR post uh, J. Felix St. James here in St. Genevieve. There was another group called the Sons of Veterans. And this, these are not guys that fought in the war. These are the sons of guys that fought in the war. And it started in Pennsylvania uh, in 1878. It was called the Pennsylvania Sons of Veterans. Uh, they changed their name to Sons of Veterans a couple of, a year later. And then there was something called the Earp uh, Sons of Veterans. And that was in Massachusetts, um, uh, Missouri, and New Jersey. I've never seen a, a name of a camp here, but the, the literature says that's where they were. But the Earp camps kind of disbanded and joined the Pennsylvania Sons of Veterans in 1880. Well, in 1881, uh, Colonel Davis started the Sons of Union Veterans in, in Pittsburgh. And they, it was designed to preserve the principles of the GAR and be, uh, provide assistance to veterans. Uh, later on in 1886, uh, the last two camps of the Pennsylvania Sons of Veterans joined them. And uh, they were, uh, actually, they changed the name to Son Sons of Union Veterans rather than Sons of Veterans in 1922. Uh, they were first, they were in existence for uh, a number of years before they even were recognized by the GAR. It wasn't until the 1888 National Encampment that the National Commander uh, did a resolution that uh, the uh, that the encampment endorsed the objects and purposes of the Order of Sons of Veterans and gives it official recognition. Then in 1954, remember Al Albert Wilson, the last surviving member of the GAR, he deeds all the records uh, of the GAR to uh, the Sons of Union Veterans of the Civil War. Uh, it is his express wish and desire that said grantee shall use its best endeavors to return said records to the communities where Grand American posts were located so far as possible and for the use and benefit of communities where such posts were located. And uh, these are a medal of the Sons of Union veterans from the time period. Then, a little bit later, when, when it was first established, it had both a civil, this keeping track of records and, and working with museums and such, but they also had a military function, and that was uh, people that would actually drill, dress in uniform, uh, and, and be in parades and stuff like that. Well, they, they did change that in 1903. They se separated them out, established military districts, seven of them. I think six of them are used now. One is not used out of the, out of the seven. Uh, Gary is a member of our, uh, our district's uh, SDR, uh, SDR group. And uh, we kind of have, still have the same thing today. We have an SU Sons of Union Veterans of the Civil War camp, and we have a Sons of Veterans Reserve. And that's where you get to dress in uniform, carry guns, and shoot them. So it's fun. Uh, the first, we, we found that there were two Sons of, of Union Veterans, or Sons of Veterans organizations here in St. Dave. It's very, very little information about them. Like looking through newspapers, uh, in 1887, uh, the Arthur W. Vance, that Vance, who was the son of William H. Vance, uh, farm post number 68, and uh, there were 20 members that started out. Uh, in 1888, uh, it mentioned who the officers were, when Evelyn uh, Lotler, John Herger, and uh, so Charles Whitlock, who was the son of J.S. Whitlock, and you can see some of those names we saw before, like Felix Herzog, uh, but uh, some of these guys, we haven't identified their fathers as members of the GAR, but they were, uh, were veterans. And then that camp kind of gets disappears. And then in, in uh, 1907, another camp is organized called the August Se Siebert Camp Number 11. And I can't find, I've only found one article so far on this camp, and it says, all the sons and veterans are urgently requested to have a meeting at the Woodman Hall, uh, Sunday, January 3rd, 1909. 
Lawrence A. Herzog, commander, John W. Schwent, who ran a bottling company at the brewery, uh, was uh, the secretary. And then they kind of disappeared after that. I, I'm still looking for more information on them. But like the uh, ladies of the GAR, the Sons of Union veterans had uh, some uh, female assistants. Uh, in 1883, the First Ladies Aid Society uh, was organized in Philadelphia. Then the next year, they were officially recognized as an auxiliary to the GAR. And had a, they had their own national encampments. I bet those were a lot of fun, too, when they all got together in 1887. And later, in 94, they changed their name to the Sons of Union Veterans Auxiliary and became later known as the Auxiliary to the Sons of Union Veterans of the Civil War. And we have a group, that, uh, our auxiliary group, that does a lot of work with us as the Sons of Union Veterans of the Civil War. Our camp was farmed, our modern day camp was farmed in 2009, uh, and we've had, uh, I think, just two, three, four different uh, commanders. Uh, Paul Cameron, the first two years, then Tom Crow, uh, Tom Grevinger was the last two years, and now Joe Williams is our, is our commander. There are still uh, a number of Sons of Union veterans of the Civil War camps around us. Uh, some of our people belong to two, like Bob Schmidt uh, belongs to, I think, 215 in Farmington. Uh, but you know, uh, General McCormick camp. Uh, our district is both, you'll see some Arkansas names on there. They don't have uh, a department in every state anymore. Ours, our Missouri uh, department encompasses uh, is it all of Arkansas, Gary, or just the northern half? It's all of Arkansas. Or all of Arkansas. Uh, you can see there's a couple in St. Louis, that one named after Sherman and one after uh, Grant. Uh, but it's a pretty good group of guys. They do reenactments. Uh, they do a lot of uh, good work, uh, especially on Memorial Day and, and other, other holidays. So that's kind of the, the end of my presentation. I wanted to close with a quote from an old army ballad. Um, you might have also heard this was the, the close of what uh, MacArthur said when he was retired by uh, Roosevelt uh, in the service. He said, old soldiers never die, they live forever. Old soldiers never die, let come what may. Proudly we march along, proudly we say, old soldiers never die, they simply fade but we can still remember. We should remember all the soldiers that have fought for our country over the years. We've had soldiers that have died in the War of 1812, the Mexican-American War, the Spanish War, the Spanish-American War, World War War, World War II, Vietnam, and the list goes on. The people that served. And we honor those that served in the Civil War, and I think we also honor all those other soldiers. Thank you. <laughs> Try to answer any questions. Bob probably knows more about this than I do. Well, I was going to ask you, did you notice that uh, the GAR was not supposed to believe, be politically active? But they were. Well, it, it was the times because Democrats were marginalized, partially due to the voting restrictions after the war and the loyalty oaths they had to sign, all that kind of stuff. But I did read one, one time, I think that 90%, this is going to sound made up, but 90% of the federal budget was for Civil War pensions. And so it was a very political deal. And I've actually seen a lot of guys that applied for pensions that ended up joining the GAR. I think they were pressured into doing it, thinking that they might have a better chance of getting a pension. But I don't think that originally that they were supposed to be political in nature. But it, there was nothing to prevent them from that. And of course, uh, the Gustav of St. Jim, the, the uh, St. James's brother, he was very politically active in St. Genevieve, though he didn't live here. Yeah, he was elect, elected to a camp up in an office up in St. Louis. Somewhere. I and I, I kind of looked at him as kind of a almost a a school marm type of guy that kind of told people 
what party they were supposed to belong to, you know, or something. I did find one advertisement in the local paper, uh, George Beckerman, who you saw was the post commander. He was running for office, and the GAR did put out a little announcement to support George Beckerman. I think they probably, uh, the businessmen that were in the GAR, I think they used that as a logo in their ads and the newspapers and stuff to uh, make sure that their GAR members knew to support them for various things. And I think I know in St. Francis County that where they had the uh, a lot of the meetings at the Dalton Hall was a guy that was politically active in there and, and he had a boarding house. So he had a, had the meetings there and no doubt served meals and, and what have you to people that came. Some say this is the first official veterans organization happening in Joe. Did Beckerman get elected? I don't know that it's a good question. I need to look that up. <laughs> Thank you.